We'll lay you 6 to 1 odds you didn't know that gaming, that's all forms of betting, lotteries, and casinos, is Canada's largest single entertainment category, bigger than movies, recorded music, and pro sports combined. For cash-strapped governments, its revenues have increased five-fold over the past decade to more than $13 billion. But at what cost? Lotteries are accused of pimping dreams. Cities are pushing back against proposed casinos, while problem gambling affects more than a million Canadians. Should Canada continue to gamble on gambling? This is Context, a look at life beyond the headlines. Our first guest thinks governments should not be gambling enablers. Globe and Mail columnist Margaret Wente was one of those lobbying against Toronto getting its first big casino. Margaret Wente, welcome to Context. <laughs> Great to have you with Hi, us. Hi, Lorna. Great to be here. Thank you. We've got a city like Calgary with seven casinos. Why are you so sure Toronto can't handle that mega casino downtown? Well, it's not that I'm opposed to gambling. Whatever, people want to gamble, that's fine. But I don't think that cities and governments should be enablers. The other reason is we just don't need one. We've got more going for us than that. Okay. What, um, what, what people would say was this was an amazing attempt to bring in tourism. I, we were looking at 12,000 jobs, Margaret. That's a big Well, you know, they, they throw these numbers around and, uh, you know, they, they talk about it as if it's going to be a jackpot, sort of a ra golden rainbow from heaven. But in fact, the Rotman Institute, the business school here at the U of T, very prestigious, actually looked at the numbers and they said there are a lot of fancy numbers, but we can't tell if they add up because this analysis makes no sense. And this is typical of the line that casino advocates will feed you. They will promise you the moon. But, uh, you know, what's really behind the numbers, nobody really knows. Okay, private sector is behind the numbers. There is a partnership that's going on. They're promising this is great for your city coffers. What are your concerns about the private sector involvement on this? Well, you know, I would dispute that. You would be amazed at how many people in the private sector are against it. They may not be against it private, pu publicly, but they're against it privately. And as soon as groups, this is, this is an issue that it crosses all party lines, crosses all ideological lines. It's not an issue of left or right or business versus um, uh, the community. Uh, I, what, I, what amazed me about this issue was the number of different kinds of people who coalesced around a no vote. What was it that said in Toronto, we just can't go there? Casinos are for cities typically on the way down not on the way up. Toronto is a city on the way up. I can't speak for Calgary, but in many parts of North America, this is true. If you're on the slippery slope mm. down, you have no other options, the you Detroit get a casino. Argument. No. That's a terrible signal to send about where our city is going. And here we are, a city with more construction cranes, says Forbes magazine, than anywhere else in the world. Well, exactly. But there, there's also the issue of the social responsibility that came into this. 200... You know, it, it may not sound like a lot, but we have 200 suicides a year from problem gambling. Is it a nanny state issue? Did this, was that part of it? There is a moral hazard here, and Warren Buffett, big capitalist, put it best. Warren Buffett, um, not exactly an anti-business guy. He said the government should not be in the position of exploiting its own people, especially its own most vulnerable people, in order to raise money. Government is there not to hoodwink its citizens, so it, it but was, to try to help them. He was trying to argue it's a tax on the poor, isn't it? It's a tax on the poor and the lower middle income, and he said it's a tax on ignorance. Because, as we know, gambling odds are always against you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to take a look at the role gambling plays across the country. Here's our Sheldon Neal. Lorna, the Responsible Gambling Council on behalf of the Canadian Partnership for Responsible Gambling, this group of course comprising of nonprofit organizations, gaming providers and gaming regulators, released 2011-2012 research numbers, their latest, looking at gambling across Canada in their Canadian Gambling Digest. Looking across the country now, there are approximately 35,600 gaming venues in total. Quebec in Ontario with the most and Prince Edward Island 
Island with the least. Now, looking at the availability of types of games across the country, Alberta scored high. Ontario, however, scoring the highest. Shifting focus now to published numbers reflecting problem gambling across this country, Manitoba scored the highest in moderate risk in problem gamblers. Saskatchewan following close behind as well. Now, overall, across Canada, 3.7% of adults classify as moderate risk or problem gamblers. I'm here with Dr. Nigel Turner, a scientist with CAMH and a prominent publisher in the field of gamlet studies. And my question to you is, what is the social cost that needs to be analyzed when looking at gambling, especially from coast to coast in the country? Well, um, the most, uh the main social cost is that um, gambling is addictive to some people and that can create a huge financial drain on families, it can uh, uh, suck a lot of money out of the community. A lot of the revenue that uh, gambling generates comes from people who are not able to stop gambling uh, even if they want to. So uh, then you have the cost of treatment, you have the cost of uh, bankruptcy proceedings, uh, you have the cost of incarceration related to crimes committed. Uh, as a result of gambling. Um, most of these costs are actually difficult to measure directly because they're, they're hidden costs. They're individual financial struggles that people um, suffer from uh, as a result of their uh, gambling problem. And to a large extent, they don't tell other people what th that they have that problem, right? Because it remains hidden. It's, there's a certain amount of embarrassment that uh, occurs with people who have a gambling problem. So they don't want to come out and talk about it. And a lot of them believe that it's not a, um, a medical problem, that it's a financial problem. They just have to uh, find more money to bet more and they'll win it back because that's, that's one of the delusions of gambling is that they're only one bet away from salvation. Dr. Nigel, thank you so much for your time. Um, and we want to know what you think at home are provincial governments addicted to gambling. With the growing cost of healthcare and infrastructure, it's hard to turn your back on billions in revenue. So do you believe the promises could get out of lottery and casino and VLT businesses if they wanted to? That's your question. Please send your answers by phone, email, Facebook, Twitter. Lorna, back to you. Okay, thank you, Sheldon. And coming up, one of the largest interfaith groups in Canada flexed its muscles and blocked a new casino that promised 12,000 jobs. Reverend Christopher White and the church mouse that roared next. <laughs> Well, are casinos good for the life of our cities? The always opinionated National Post columnist Jesse Klein and Reverend Christopher White are here to uh, give us some perspective on that. Welcome both of you to Context. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Great to have you. Jesse, you are in favor of a casino in, in the big city, in any big city. Tell us why. Um, for a number of reasons. Uh, here in Toronto, we had a debate a while back about whether or not there should be a casino. And I think it would bring both financial and economic benefits to the city. There would be people that would come in from elsewhere um, to gamble at the casino, to use the other facilities, whether there's hotels, restaurants, and whatnot. Um, the municipal government was also negotiating with the provincial government to get a cut of the revenue from the casino. So that's a potential source of funding that could be used to build subways, uh, improve road infrastructure, infrastructure, all sorts of different things yeah. in the city. Yes, your did. column promised us one kilometer a year of free subways. There was a report um, that used casino revenue plus a number of other gambling sources and claimed that uh, using that we could build a kilometer a year. Um, that might be a little bit high, but uh, certainly there would be extra revenue coming in and Toronto along with a number, many Canadian cities, do have an infrastructure deficit. Okay, Christopher White, you had 250 people behind you, all of the same opinion, representing different faith communities, saying Jesse is dead wrong. Why, why are you so opposed? Well, I would take issue probably uh, economically, but to me it's an issue of what is healthy for a city? What is the type of economy we wish to create? What is the type of community that we wish to create? And fundamentally, uh, a casino is antithetical to those things that, that bind us together. It's a creation of addictions. Um, it's a creation of harm to our neighbor. And as members of faith communities, are, we, we are driven to love our neighbor and to act in love towards our neighbor. And we simply believed 
uh, and we had a wide range of faith communities, um, you know, Christian, Jewish, Jain, Muslim, Sikh, all of whom said the same thing. Okay. It's antithetical to who we are as, as a people of faith. Jesse, does that uh, sound valid to you? Well, I understand that there are people that do have objections to casinos. I, I, I don't think it's valid, though, to, because there, it should be an individual choice. And as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, casinos are, there are a lot of people who enjoy it as a source of entertainment. Um, and I think people should have that freedom to decide. I mean, if they want to go to a movie on a Saturday night or if they want to go yeah, to a bar, but this is bar, our government go building something, right? This is government-enabled casino. It's true, and it's not ideal. Now, the alternative is that right now we have a lot of people that are going online to gamble. Um, the money is going overseas to, uh, you know, sports books in the UK or... So bring them all home, let it all come back. You don't think they would go online? I, I think people would continue to go online if we had online sites here in Canada that were able to compete. We could keep that, a lot of that money at home and we could ensure that they're offering fair games. Um, we can also bring people out into the open where we can better spot gambling addiction and bring people into treatment. Okay, Reverend Wright, you actually think this, um, this presents a danger to the human condition. Explain that. Well, absolutely, because the gambling industry is, is based on one thing. It's based on creating people who can lose, giving them the illusion that they have a chance at winning, and then taking their money as much as they can possibly get um, from the slot machines that are built and designed um, to have you play repeatedly, giving you, the, uh, giving you the same, the feeling of winning even as your money's going out the door, to all the way the, other, the odds are stacked against the individual gambler. So it's built to make you lose you with an illusion this, to win. You argue this was like, this is so against the golden rule. Oh, it's totally, it, you know, the golden rule is to do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And that doesn't mean creating addictions. That doesn't mean building an economic system on smoke and mirrors. Okay, but uh, Jesse, I don't know if you want to say it before I say it, churches do bingos, we gamble, we have. So uh, there's been all kinds of lottery activity in the church. Does that, isn't that well, the same I, I, breaking of the golden rule? My particular faith community actually doesn't. Uh, the United Church is, has, has had a long history um, about uh, regarding gambling. But others, you know, to compare a bingo in the basement of a church to a mega casino is kind of like comparing, oh, I don't know, a slingshot to an atom bomb. I mean, they're completely different scales. Okay, Jesse, you, uh, you, you have argued that the 12,000 jobs, we didn't really have any business just turning that away in a climate like this. But there is the social responsibility aspect. How do you weigh that in the economic balance? Well, there's no, there's no question that there are people that have problems with gambling and that there are um, things associated with casinos um, that we need to take care of as a society. And, and most of that has to do with people who get addicted to gambling. Having said that, there, the question is, if we build a casino, are there going to be more people who develop addiction issues? And there's been a number of studies um, in the United States and elsewhere that have shown that as we have more, the pre more prevalence of gambling, as there's more casinos, more lotteries, more online gaming, that the rates of gambling addiction stay relatively constant. And the rates of bankruptcies and gambling addiction in areas where casinos are built also stay relatively constant. So I think if people want to gamble, they're going to find that outlet. And whether it's going online or it's playing the lottery or anything else, uh, we're not going to stop them from gambling. The question is, is are, we go are, are our governments going to make money off it or are we going to allow right. somebody else? And the argument has been the numbers are just too loopy. There's just no good solid, you know, whether it's the Rotman School quoted earlier or Warren Buffett or whatever, no one seems to know these mysterious numbers. It, it's always hard to get exact figures until something is set up, but I think uh, there's no question that the city was going to receive revenue from a casino, um, that there would be some economic benefit, I, which I think has been overplayed by a lot of people. Okay, uh, Reverend White, that was a big economic showdown over saying no to the casino. What would your community, who led the charge to say no, say we should replace that with? We are addicted to the revenues, whether it's our hockey arenas, our sports programs, what do we replace that with? I think the, the fundamental question that we're facing as a, as a society is what is the type of economic development that we, we wish to create? And instead of spending the time and energy on issues such as casinos, to me the question is how is it that we can create 
businesses and opportunities that are going to be sustainable for Canadians over the long haul. We are seeing a growing gap um, between the wealth, wealth and the shrinking middle class in this country. And that is where we as, as citizens, as faith communities, as governments need to be focusing our energy with a laser-like precision uh, to create the sort of businesses and opportunities that, as I said, will sustain Canadian families and allow them to raise their families and live with dignity. All right. And to me, that is, is where we need to be focusing our energies. Great, great opinions here on casinos. Thank you both. And uh, now to Sheldon Neal. Thank you, Lorna. And in this edition of The Rundown, I caught up with MPP Peter Tabbins as he candidly answered the question in this edition, what's wrong with casinos? Here's what he had to say. The Rundown, real people, real talk. What's wrong with casinos is that they're a shell game. They don't actually create wealth, they just shuffle it around and generally, they take it out of the pockets of people who are very hard pressed and put it into the pockets of companies that are already extraordinarily wealthy. This was not about moving tourists into Toronto, this was about moving casinos close to their customers, the people of Toronto, to extract as much money out of them as possible. I had no interest in that. I don't want to put more people into a situation where their gambling addiction puts their families in peril, where the money flowing into the casino shuts down the retail economy of the city. And to tell you the truth, I don't think a plan that's based on expanding private gambling and taking in more and more young people, which is in fact what the plan is for modernization of Ontario Lottery and Gaming, is a plan that makes sense for our economy and our society. And that's your rundown. And now it's time to find out what you think at home. Our question is this, is there any difference between governments selling liquor and governments running casinos? There are so many parallels between them, but do you see any differences? Please send your answers by phone, email, Facebook, or Twitter. Okay, coming up after the break, when God and gambling collide. That's next. We want you to be a part of our studio audience. If you're in the Toronto area, contact us. Be part of the conversation. Well, all it took was throwing one quarter in through the slots to change the direction of our next guest's life. Please welcome Joan Velkamp to Context. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this story begins in Alberta which was one of the biggest buy-ins for VLTs, video lottery terminals, the crack cocaine of the gambling industry. And um, you popped in a quarter. Describe what happened. Describe your introduction to the VLT. Well, many years ago, I was uh, bartending in a little corner pub in Calgary and uh, was there for a little while until the VLTs arrived into our bar and wasn't really attracted to it, I don't believe, at first. But over time, kind of on a break or so, I put a quarter in. And uh, over time, threw another quarter in, another quarter in, and it turned into a raging addiction. How did you know that it was a raging addiction? How did you know you were a problem gambler? Because I thought of it continuously. And I gambled almost every day. When I wasn't actually gambling, when I was at my job, I would think, where am I going to go today? How much can I afford to spend today? When should I stop if I go past this amount that I put into the machines? Okay, so you have a crushing gambling addiction, always VLTs. Uh, it turned into other things. Uh, I began to travel into areas uh, in the Caribbean and working uh, in different fields that took me to islands and different places in, in the Bahamas where they have a lot of casinos. So in Canada, for the most part, it was the VLTs. And that's where it all started. And that's, I was very addicted to that. But then when I went traveling, it became other things, blackjack, uh, other lottery machines, and poker. And how did you start to get free of this? What happened? How do you break a gambling addiction? We want to know, bottom line. I don't think anybody can. I don't think, I, I, I couldn't break it myself. We're just going to have to accept this? That no. you're one of those? No. OK, you have no. an alternative. There's a, a very wonderful and full and complete alternative. In 1997, I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my savior. And he transformed me, he began to transform me from the inside. And he showed me that what I was doing with gambling wasn't I was a bad girl 
and I needed to stop it. He wanted me to stop because he loves me so much and he doesn't want me to hurt by this anymore. I was, I was being very hurt emotionally and spiritually by my own addiction. So it was love, God's love. It was God's love. That propelled you to yes. stop. How, yes. how did you know that? How did the penny drop on that? It, it took time for me to realize. I still probably gambled for about a year after I came to know the Lord. Uh, it was something that just didn't happen overnight. Something. Okay, some people say, hey, I'm just blowing off steam. I'm just having a little bit of fun out. But you've come to call gambling sin, and you've actually called it bondage. Why? It's both. Why? It's both. It's bondage because you can't stop. I gambled. I, as I thought about it, Recently, I thought it was maybe seven years, but it was maybe as much as nine years that I gambled. And I, I, I couldn't stop on my own. I needed divine help. In your gambling, you had to put yourself somehow in a place to get that, that idea, that message. It's, it seems so clear to, to hear you say you felt like supernaturally God reaching into your life saying, I've got something better. How, yes. did, you, did it pop out of the sky? How does a person get this? No, I, I was uh, rooming with a lady down in Florida for a while, and she was a Christian. And I began to uh, hear her messages from her church in her home. And it wasn't so much the words, but I did end up hearing the, the pastor's testimony. And his testimony compelled me just to see the love of God come into a person's life who had a very similar, in some ways, life that I had. So the disconnect here is that you're, you're sensing I've got incredible unhappiness of what's going on in my gambling life. You weren't at peace about it. And yet there was always this offer that there's a spiritual peace mm -hmm. that can soothe, can let this thing go. Absolutely. And Absolutely. It, it's different than 12-step. I found Jesus was a one-step. Well, maybe two. The first step was me receiving him as my savior, as my personal savior and beginning a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ myself. That was the first step. And then he began to change me from the inside out. And that, that's what eventually compelled me and propelled me to be able to stop. A lot of people um, gamble who have faith. They, they just, it's just part of something. Would you just say, this is really, we heard some challenges today. Would you say we can handle that in culture? We can handle that no, in society? No. It's just, it's, 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 there's trouble on that ticket. I would say to anybody, any addiction, gambling addiction, any, one coin, one drink, one line of cocaine, one look at something we shouldn't look at, we need to be very, very careful because it can turn into an addiction. Joan, yours is a powerful personal story. Let's get a little feedback from the audience. We've got a question in the middle there. Thank you very much. Um, so it's very heartwarming to hear that you were able to break out of your struggles with gambling, but you did note that it took eight or nine years to break out, and uh, this required you waiting for God to, you know, tap you on the shoulder and speak to you. But what would you recommend for somebody who, earlier than that, without wanting to wait so long for God to just want to break out earlier, uh, to break out of this struggle? What, what's your recommendation? Well, first of all, it didn't take God nine years to break me. I was gambling before I came to know the Lord, probably for around eight or nine years. And then I probably gambled uh, after I came to the Lord for a year. Um, all I can say is I was a gambling addict, a raging, a very addicted to gambling. And now I'm not. I am completely free. And Jesus did it. And he did it in his time. But also I needed to realize that he can. He can set us free from any addiction. He can set us free from bad relationships. He can set us free from anything that binds us. He wants to, and he can. He has the power to do that. He went to the cross for that. And so some things will change overnight when we come to the Lord. But some things take time. But it's our part also that, that it takes. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Joan, thank you very much. And after the break, my closing thoughts on gambling, casinos, and some of these big questions.
Context is all about interactive. So call us, email us, tweet, or Facebook us. How else are you going to join the conversation? And that's something you don't want to gamble on. Well, it might surprise the casual observer to learn that the Bible is rife with gambling and moments of random chance. Aaron cast lots to choose the scapegoat at the altar. It was a casting of lots, a sort of roll of the dice, that caused Matthias to be chosen as the disciple to replace Judas. Now, that's a far cry from the dopamine hit to our brain that slot machines and VLTs are designed to deliver. The difference was this. When dice was thrown in the Bible, it meant a person would be content with what God decides. Dice would say, hey, this game of chance is up to God. The dice was being cast to God. Now, God has blessed us with a free society, so much freedom of choice that we can have the freedom to gamble and also the freedom to take care of problem gamblers among us, more than 200 of whom take their lives each year in Canada. So on our website, you will find resources for how you can get professional help for gambling in Ontario. Those resources are free. Well, the discussion about gambling in casinos it's vital that we not let our obligation to one another be lost, yes, in the shuffle. For all of us, I'm Lorna Duick. Thanks for watching and join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. <laughs>